Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nick Reitman, and I'd like to welcome you to this weekend's Labor and Politics panel. Uh, Chicago is an appropriate city to convene a panel discussing the relationship between the political left and labor movement, and also the relationship between utopia and program. Chicago's labor movement has been electrified by struggles with social critiques broader and tactics more confrontational than what much of the American labor movement has seen in decades. Leadership in both the 2008 United Electric Plant, or United Electric Plant Occupation of Republic Windows and Doors, and the 2012 Chicago Teacher Strike, both prominently featured self-declared members of the political left. Both struggles also mobilized deep-seated discontent with the fiscal discipline imposed by global finance and began to raise a more general social critique beyond the sectional demands of the workers involved. On the other hand, few cities better exemplify the American labor movement's traditional pragmatism. Chicago is one of the last great union towns, celebrating state-blessed labor management partnerships. It's a town where mature, union, mature unions, quote, do not need the strike, and where Senate seats and union jurisdiction over state workers can be offered for lifetime union employment. Chicago's labor radicals and labor's old guard in Chicago, however, both universally acknowledge a historically unprecedented state of weakness for workers. This panel is about the vision of the next labor. Must labor rebuild itself in the fight or with the fight of the political left for a society beyond work, class, and borders? Does the labor movement need left politics? Or should it sidestep the liability of social theory and the real politic of collective bargaining? To get at the vision of the future, we have also asked the panelists how the defeats of the labor movement and how the defeats of the political left have been determined by their relationship together, together historically. And finally, we have asked the panel to reflect on the relationship between the political left and the labor movement in the context of economic globalization. Our first panelist today is Stephen Ashby. He's a clinical professor with the Labor Education Program at the school, uh, or at the University of Illinois at Chicago with the School of Labor and Employment Relations. He has written extensively about the importance of coalition building and rank and file labor empowerment during one of the hardest fought defeats of the American labor movement at the AE Staley Corn Processing Plant in Decatur, Illinois. His writing includes the work, the 2009 work, Staley, The Fight for a New American Labor Movement, <coughs> movement written with C.J. Hawkins. Recently, Stephen has helped initiate the Chicago Labor Solidarity Committee and the Chicago Teachers Solidarity Committee, which has worked closely with the Chicago Teachers Union in mobilizing community, student, and labor groups for the fall 2012 Chicago Teachers Union strike. And now, the broad, and now mobilizes for the broader fight against school closings and privatization. Our next panelist, who's actually on the end today, is Sam Gindin, the former research director of the Canadian Auto Workers, and co-author with Leo Panish of The Making of Global Capitalism. After his retirement from the Canadian Auto Workers in 2000, he joined the faculty of York University in the Political Science Department as the Packer Visiting Professor in Social Justice, where he taught until 2010. He is currently involved with the Socialist Project in Canada and in organizing the Greater Toronto Workers' Assembly as a model to link the working class across union and community organizations. And our final panelist, this afternoon, who's in the middle, 
is Andres Kyrgyzstas. Excuse me. <laughs> he is a member of the Central Committee of Syriza, Greece, and coordinator of its political planning committee. And with that, I will let the uh, remarks begin by our panelists. After the initial round of remarks, um, we'll have an opportunity for some questions uh, from the floor. Thank you. So I'm a, a labor educator means I work at a university where you have to have a PhD, and the PhD has very little to do with my teaching. My teaching is steward training, my teaching is internal organizing, how members can build power at work. My teaching is how to build a contract campaign, how to organize and mobilize your members, leading up to bargaining, my teaching is strike strategy. Although we do have an undergraduate program as well. These are all <laughs> non-credit classes. We go to union halls where workers come to our classroom. And as part of that job, I was honored to be invited by the Chicago Teachers Union to be part of their organizing team and to come to their uh, organizing meetings every two weeks to, for a year to plan their contract campaign, to plan how to transform their union and then to plan the strike. And one of the great experiences of my life. So I want to talk about that a bit. This is certainly a time for conferences. It's always a time for analysis and reflection, but it's also very much a time for activism and for action. I want to wonder, I want to ask, uh, just so I get a sense of the audience, how many of you, I know you're from across the country, how many of you went to the Wisconsin protests? One hand? How many of you participated in Occupy? All right, there we go. How many of you are from Northern Illinois or Southwest Wisconsin? So that would be embarrassing if I asked you how many of you went downtown during the teacher strike. I live in New York now. So. I live in New York. <laughs> My parents are. <laughs> you know, I think it's been the last two years have been kind of amazing for someone who's been doing this for thirty something years. Uh, like Dickens said, it's the best of times and worst of times. We have the worst attacks on workers, certainly public sector workers, and we have you know, some of the most exciting developments with the mass protests in Wisconsin, the occupation of the state capitol, and then the Occupy Wall Street movement, galvanizing young people, and <clears throat> unemployed and poor from many generations, uh, and then the uh, Chicago teachers' strike, uh, which is certainly one of the most important strikes in the last 20 or 30 years in this country. So I think it's a time, I know your conference description talks about analysis, I don't know how many of the workshops talk about activism. This is a time to be active. This is a time to change your life. This is a time to say all in. Because we can change America now. I can't speak about Canada, Sam will talk about Canada, we'll talk about Greece, but I can talk about America. This is a time to stretch yourself and push yourself. Now, I'm supposed to talk about labor and the left, and I will talk. I'm going to be very pragmatic and talk about strategy and program and concrete experiences. And I don't quite know exactly what the organizers mean by the left. Um, I'm an activist, so my experience with the left is, is two, twofold. One is the activists. Those on the left, and there are only a handful of organizations in America, I would say, that are actually dedicated to building social movements. And the other is the groups that come and sell their newspapers and don't do anything else and denounce every leadership of every movement for not being good enough. So I guess one thing I would say about labor and the left is if you're in a group that says, movements come and go. The primary task of our group is to recruit to our organization. You should leave it. It's dead. It's worthless. Those are strong words. The main task of the left and progressives in general is, number one, to be the best builders of social movements. And number two, to join the conversation, to learn from labor history, to learn from the history of social movements, to study them, and bring those lessons and jo humbly join that conversation about how we can win. In this country, we seem to have uh, long-term memory loss. We, we build these movements, we go through defeats and victories, and then we forget. How did we win? And why did we lose? And we keep repeating the same mistakes. This leaves us with the labor leadership we have. So I'm going to talk about teachers in Wisconsin and Occupy a little bit. I'd say about the teachers first. It's a victory. It was a huge victory. 
that we need victories. Wisconsin was amazing. Wisconsin was stunning. It changed me. And it's hard to change me. But it was not a victory, at least not yet. Wall Street changed me. Occupy Wall Street was historic, but it was not a victory, at least not yet. And I don't think our problem is apathy. I don't think the problem in this country is people saying, I don't deserve a decent wage. We should really pay a third of the people household income under 35000 a year. We should cut Social Security. Money. That's not our problem. Our problem isn't apathy. Our problem is a lack of hope, a lack of belief that we can change things. We're organizing, as Nick said, against school closures. The mayor is closing 54 schools, mostly in black community. And our main problem when we talk to people is not anger. They're angry. They're pissed. Our problem is when they say, but what, what's the point? What can we do? The mayor has all the power. We need, our problem is we need a strategy that can win, and we need victories that inspire people. And believe me, the teacher struggle has inspired teachers across this country and public sector workers. I know I spoke twice to Ask Me organizers, about 50 of them, and they organized a contract campaign among their members because they were heading towards a strike because of what Governor Quinn and the state was doing to them. The demand for well, his first demand was your different uh, pay levels depending on your occupation. Cut two pay levels. Cut ten thousand out of your pay on average. That's just unbelievable. And they were totally inspired by the teachers. And the reason they got a decent contract was because they were inspired by the teachers and they organized their members. Victories matter. And we've had our share of defeats. For thirty years we've had defeats, and then right to work, right to work. No rights at work, it should be called, in Indiana and then Michigan and a dozen other states. So there's a war on workers. I'm not going to go into depth on that. And we, you know, the, the strike is our most powerful weapon, but we've backed away from the strike. And workers have backed away from the strike. In the 50s, we averaged 352 major strikes a year. The government only keeps track of strikes involving 1,000 or more workers. So that's not all the strikes. Uh, peak was 2.7 million workers on strike in 1952. In the 60s, it was 283 major strikes. In the 70s, 289 major strikes on average. And then we had PACO, the air traffic controllers. And workers started getting fired for going on strike. And we dropped in the 80s to 83 major strikes. And our average over the last five years in America is five, involving 78,000 workers. We used to have two, two and a half million workers on strike every year. Now we have 78,000. The two reasons people don't go on strike. One is they're happy. You get a contract, you don't need to strike. The other is you're scared to death you're gonna get fired. You think you have no power. You don't think you can win, or your leadership doesn't have a strategy to win. So what's most important about the CTO is they showed us how to win. They showed us you can win. They showed us you can fight and win. And we need that in this country. We desperately need that. And they also showed us the Teacher union after teacher union were capitulating. Uh, you know, the right wing does a very good job of trying to take over language. They've taken over the word reform, which used to mean demanding things improve for working people. In terms of education, it means demanding by the right wing things get worse for working people. Mm -hmm. We privatize our school. Really, the Republican agenda and the Democratic agenda for education are, the, are virtually the same. You can talk about good and bad things about President Obama, but in terms of his education agenda, Rahm Emanuel, the mayor here, has privatized the schools. Wipe out the teachers' unions. The teachers are all the problem. Belittle, demean, insult the teachers. Fire them all. You need 25-year-old teachers, not 45-year-old teachers. You have to pay them twice as much. Get rid of the union. Get rid of their voice. Make them work more hours. Blame them for everything. Duck any discussion of poverty and racism violence in our society, the abandonment of the black community in this city, the complete abandonment. The, the west side of Chicago and parts of the south side are just devastating. They've been that way for decades. They're completely abandoned, mass unemployment. And that's a huge part of what's going on with schools here. So the agenda of this strike was also to take on one of the most powerful democratic mayors in this, in this country, which made it even more important. So how do you win? I'm just going to focus, these are we have a short amount of time, we can talk about many things in the discussion. First, you build power at work. You organize the members. For too long, we've had a top-down labor movement. No social movement ever wins without building from the bottom up. The labor movement won in the 30s by building a bottom-up movement. 
we have a labor movement that is, the staff does everything. The leadership is in charge. The leadership give orders uh, in too many of our unions. And this union organized school by school tens of, tens of thousands of hours of conversations with teachers, teachers among themselves. Can we win? How do we win? How do we fight? It takes a hell of a lot of time. It takes a lot of staff working 80 hours a week. 600 buildings, 600 schools, organizing contract committees. The members coming together. Every member being talked to constantly. What do you think? Here's what we're doing. Can you come to this action? It's totally trust the members. Organize the members, develop new leaders, mentor new leaders. You know, we have too many labor leaders in this country that are scared of this whole concept because somebody might decide to run against them for office. And it's killing us. And you've got to encourage initiative, which is what the teachers union did. And these local committees, they marched on their aldermen. They marched through the neighborhoods. They uh, put out their own t-shirts on their, their own schools. They held their own community meetings. They organized. They took initiative. And people came forward. And you could see this change of the membership during the contract campaign and then during the strike. The, the transformations, we all talk about that in the left, people changing, radicalizing. You could see this among the teachers. You could see it among the 26,000 teachers. People transform. I could see it just on the marches. One day, all they want to mark, chant is CTU, CTU, CTU. The next day, it's uh, go up, go down, Chicago is a union town. Well, that, those are just two different slogans. One is my union. The other is we are union. We are all union. You know, you can see this transformation. And it's why the strike, for those of you not from Chicago, didn't end on Sunday. The leadership had a contract they were ready to recommend. They went to the, what's called the House of Delegates meeting, 800 members from each school. Some high schools have more than one member. And the, and the delegates said, no, we're not ready. We're not ready to vote on this thing. You said we're a rank and file union. You transformed this union over the last year. We're sending it back to the members. So for two days, in every building, in every school across 600, across the system, Teachers sat in circles and they debated the contract line by line. And it wasn't, have we won enough for ourselves? Or have we won enough for the students? Should we keep fighting for the students and the parents? We've got our, you know, 2 or 3% raise. We've beaten back their concessions on merit pay and health care. Have we won enough for them? It was absolutely democratic. And it was not what the leadership wanted, but the leadership, when they heard this, said, you're right. You decide. This is your union. You want to meet for two days and discuss and hear what the rank and file say? That's what we're going to do. And it was the same with Wisconsin. It was totally a rank and file movement. Now, most of it was not union members. But across the state, rank and file unionists were meeting and organizing and knocking on doors. Wisconsin was not a top-down affair. It was an absolutely bottom-up affair. It was not called by any union. It was out of the control of the unions in Wisconsin. And this is a lesson of every social movement. The second is is the teacher struggle was a working class struggle. Uh, it's a fundamental lesson of our history that we forget. Every struggle to win, every union struggle to win must be a working class struggle. At least when there's a war on you, as we face now. Maybe not in the 50s and 60s, but now, if your struggle is we want a better contract, you're going to lose. And this leadership of the teachers union understood that. They've been organizing for years before they took power. It wasn't an electoral caucus. And it was all about reaching out to the parents, building coalitions with parent groups, organizing in the neighborhoods to fight to defend public education. So the slogan Karen Lewis, the President of the Union, said, this isn't about a contract. This is a fight for the soul of public education. That's the kind of language that works when we win. That's why 110 of us came together to form the Chicago Teacher Solidarity Campaign and dedicated our lives for three months to building support for them. And this was the same with Wisconsin. Like I said, the vast majority of those demonstrations, the 150,000 in the capital, they were not unions. This was a working class struggle. This was labor and community groups. It was the same with Occupy, which was not a union struggle at all. And which should totally inspire us. It should totally teach the labor. We can build a mass movement. Wisconsin and Occupy and the teachers showed us that. They showed us how. This is where our power lies. It always has. And third, the teachers taught us we've got to fight in the streets. Our power is in the streets. Somehow, labor evolved into thinking our power is in lobbying. And our power is lobbying politicians. And our power is getting politicians elected.
and then hopefully they'll do what we ask them to do, which they don't, of either party. And the teachers said, no, that's not where our power is. I, I met with a, a teacher, they brought people into our organizing meetings from the strikes, the last strike was 25 years ago. And she said, I said, well, how did it work then? She said, well, we go out and pick it for an hour and a half in the morning, we go out and eat school, we go out and have breakfast, and we go home. And I said, well, that's really interesting. That's not our plan. Our plan is to go downtown Chicago and have a mass mobilization every afternoon. And she said, no, you can't ask the teachers to do that. Well, we did ask the teachers to do that. They were exhilarated about doing that. They knew that that's where their power lay. And a mass mobilization every day shutting down downtown. 25, 30,000 teachers and supporters. A sea of red shirts. Our power is in the streets. And then Occupy is teaching us. The Whittier school parents occupied their part of their school demanding a library in Chicago in the fall of 11. The Piccolo parents occupied their school in February of 2012 demanding it not be closed. Uh, parents of, and teachers have occupied outside the mayor's office, and that's going to happen again. We just had a demonstration on March 27th, about 4,000 downtown, and 140 of us, including myself, got arrested in nonviolent civil disobedience. And that's going to happen in this fight against school closure. I don't know exactly where that's going. There are going to be mass walkouts from schools, I hope, by high school students. There are going to be occupations of schools. Because the mayor is extremely powerful in this city, as, as the, whatever you call it, the ruling class are across the country. And lobbying doesn't change it. We're not going to stop school closing. You're not going to win a strike by lobbying or talking. It's going to be your power in the streets if they fear you. It's a fundamental lesson of the 30s. And the teachers did this over and over again in their contract campaign. And that was our power of Wisconsin. The mass demonstration, really, you could argue the reason we lost in Wisconsin is we stopped being in the streets. It was derailed. And it was our power with Occupy. And we lost that power when the government repression drove people out of the encampments. And another lesson I think the teachers are teaching us, and Occupy certainly taught us, and Wisconsin taught us, is when you're in a war, you don't tie one hand behind your back. And we've been doing that too much of the labor official thing for decades. Now, I'm not a violent person, but I hear this one on TV. You don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Um, I'm actually a very nonviolent person. So that means you do whatever you have to do to win. And with what you've been doing doesn't work, you don't do it anymore. And if conventional tactics don't work, you don't do them anymore. If you're a union leader, you don't run your union like it's a business as usual situation when you're facing death and destruction. When there may not be any union movement in 20 years, the way we're going for 15 years in this country. We're down to 6.6% in the private sector. The law is designed in this country for us to lose. If we follow the law, we will lose. I, I'm telling everybody I work with, go reread Letter from a Birmingham Jail by Dr. Martin Luther King. Mass nonviolent civil disobedience. Those of us that were in the occupation of the Capitol building in Wisconsin, it was transformative. Two, three thousand people in there at a time, packed in there on multiple levels. The energy people felt, the power they felt. Illegally occupying, trespassing the uh, Capitol Hill, the Capitol building is beautiful. Now, talk of a general strike there by the unions. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. It will have to happen in the future. Mass nonviolent civil disobedience. The lessons of the civil rights movement. We seem to have forgotten the lessons of the labor movement. The encampments of Occupy, the trespassing, the thousands of arrests. That is our path forward. I think if we use violence, we're going to lose. But I think if we obey the law, we're going to Like I said, I don't know what's going to happen with the teachers. We're not quite where we are in Europe, where they have political strikes. We could use that as a country. Although when Wisconsin happened, when the teachers for four days refused to go to work, that was a political strike. Now they called it a sicket, but it was a political strike. And we need to spread the lesson of that. That for the first time in a generation, we had a union, individual workers. The union would have been uh, sued and fined hundreds of thousands of dollars if they called it. Individual workers in conversations said, we're not going to work because we're opposing this legislation. It's illegal in this country. The 
laws designed for us to lose. And finally, on message. I think the teachers have a lot to teach us. Because their message and their struggle was never, it's all about us, we deserve a fair contract. They had righteous issues. The mayor demanded they work 20% more hours with no increase in pay at all. That's 20% for free. The mayor wanted uh, merit pay. They paid people they liked more. And try to push people out by freezing their wages, older workers in particular, experienced teachers. Um, so they had their issues, and they won on those issues. But their fight from the beginning, as I said, was this is about justice. This is about defending public education. This is about stopping the privatization of every public school in Chicago and nationally. And when I talk about messaging, I mean, labor is just not that good at it. it sometimes people say, oh, that's public relations, that's advertising. Why are you even talking about that crap? I talk about it because the right wing in this country is extremely good at it. And we need to persuade the public to support our struggles. We need to support, persuade them to be on the streets with us. And it's not advertising, it's not selling something, it's putting your message in the right way and having the right message. And the message that we need to have is, as I said, we fight for the working class. We, not, no union is, should be on struggle saying we fight for our own contract. And the teachers taught us that. And the teachers have been saying over and over again, you know what the problem is? It's a racist educational system. It's an abandonment of the black community. It's a failure of capitalism. They're, they're, they're talking truth to power in a way unions have not done in this country since the 1930s. And 66% of Chicago public school parents supported the teachers five days into a strike. Now this is teach parents. Where are your kids going to go? What are you going to do? you got to go to work. It, it's not easy on them. And the mayor is saying, these are horrible teachers. They don't care about your children. There's tremendous pressures. But because they organized for years, talking to parents, going door to door, working with parent groups in a coalition. They had two thirds of the parents. And then the black and Hispanic community was much higher. A support, five days into a strike. And when the teachers marched, they had a mass rally downtown on May 23rd. They had a mass rally on Labor Day downtown. And then they had informational picket lines. And then they were on strike. And every time the media talked to one of them, they never said, I deserve more money. One of the slogans we have in labor when we go on strike is unfair to labor. It's the worst slogan. We're so stupid sometimes. We win when it's a justice movement. And when we believe it in our heart, it's not like we can think well, what will work to build public support. You've got to believe it. Every teacher that was interviewed said, a quarter of the schools don't have libraries. Why does every suburban school and the mayor's kid's school have a library? Every suburban school has a social worker and a nurse. Why do we get one one day out of five? How can I teach when there's no air conditioning? And it's late May or June and it's 80, 90 degrees outside and it's 100 degrees in my classroom. Why is there air conditioning in every suburban school, but our schools don't have air conditioning? Why have our schools in the black and Hispanic community been abandoned? Why, why, why would I denounce this as racist? You say, oh, how dare you do that? Every teacher, we demand smaller classes. We are fighting for our students. This is a justice struggle. And this was also the power of Wisconsin. One of the things I loved about Wisconsin is there were like 100,000 handmade signs. People spent hours and hours making beautiful signs, explaining what they stood for, why they were angry, why they attacked the mayor, why they were opposing the governor, why they were defending social services and fighting for democracy. When we have Labor is a, social, a civil rights movement. We have power. When we have labor as a social movement in the streets, we have power. When we are a workers' rights movement, a human rights movement, we have power. When it's unfair to labor, we're going to die. And frankly, we lose power when the signs are all pre-printed by the union. I'm not saying I'm against that. Ask me at a good, the government workers in Wisconsin, their slogan was free, just one word. That's a good slogan. We gotta make our own signs, we gotta make our own banners, we gotta tell our own stories. And the AFL-CIO for years has talked about the middle class. We've got to defend the middle class, we're fighting for the middle class. It's gone nowhere. And then along comes Occupy and says, no, what it is is fight for the 99% and the whole country is talking about it. Totally transform the conversation. Maybe we haven't won legislative changes. I mean, Occupy shouldn't just 
knocked the entire labor movement on their feet. I said, now we know how to talk, about, how to, talk to people. It's the 1% versus the 99%. The AFL-CIO runs away from the phrase working class. They run away from the phrase class struggle. They run away from the fact that corporations long ago in this country declared a class war on workers. We have much to learn from Wisconsin and much to learn from Occupy on how to build a movement and how to put a message out that can reach people. I mean, I, I see the charts on conversations in the media and the use of phrases like 1% and 99% and went from almost none to them. It was massive. They changed the conversation. So I'll, I'll conclude there and just return to my opening remarks. If you're not an activist, I don't know if you are, it's time to become an activist. You need to study, you need to analyze, you need conferences like this, but it's time for all of it. Things are changing in America. I'm a historian by training. I have a doctorate in history at the University of Chicago. And you can never predict history. Things look pretty bleak in 1929. In 1934, we have three citywide general strikes, and we began the transformation of the country. Is this 1934 for us? I don't know. You know, is this our 1968? I don't know. Can make a prediction, and you, you won't be around to tell me I was wrong. Mm -hmm. But I think so. The last two years have been really, really exciting and transformative. This is a time to be active. This isn't a time to say all in. This is a time to say we can change history. anywhere like this, uh, there was an explosion of a new industrial, a new form, working class, form of working class organization. Industrial unionism really came into its own. And what seems to me is strikingly missing this time is the limited extent to which there, there is even a serious debate about whether it's a time to actually think through new forms of working class organization. I'll call it by that as I go along. Uh, when I look at Occupy, uh, what I see is somebody telling us that audacious action actually can touch an earth, which is exciting. I see somebody speaking about class in crude terms, and that also touches an earth and a message to the labor movement. But what I saw the labor movement doing in Canada was at a time when, especially in Toronto, Caterpillar plant was closing. Uh, in the 90s when they tried to close, we just took it over. So, you know, the leader of the union went down to Occupy and to tell them that he supports them. What we should have been doing is taking over something substantive and something real and something not just symbolic and spreading it to the labor. It's exactly, it should have been a wake up call for labor. That's not what happened. Uh, when I looked at Wisconsin, same thing. It was incredibly moving, exciting. You see the potential of the working class and not just in its organized form, uh, all kinds of people acting. Uh, you probably define working class. But it's not just that it ended, it's things do end. It's what would the organizational capacity keep something going in the Wisconsin community? Why wasn't there some kind of an assembly form that continued to discuss how do we continue this struggle and take it uh, further? We had this amazing series of activities in the mid-90s in Canada where we organized <coughs> shutdowns of communities, general strikes in communities, uh, which we would announce three months in advance, so everybody was talking and preparing for it then. And then we would hit one community and go to another community. We did this for two and a half years, rotating general strikes across communities. I don't know if anybody else who did that. It was amazing because of it was constantly discussed. You're constantly developing a new cadre. All kinds of new workers uh, became active. And then one day, the labor leadership decided this was enough. I don't particularly blame them. I was surprised it went on that long. Mm -hmm. Unions aren't revolutionary organizations, so they created space. That was great. But the question was, where was the left? 
why didn't we come out of this every time we built a coalition? We have coalitions that included the, the co-chair of the community and labor in each community. And when we left, why was it just closed? Why did we just move to another community? Why wasn't there organizing in those communities? Why weren't people recruited to some kind of a larger project? And that raises some fundamental questions about uh, the limits of unions and where the unions are at today. Uh, one of the things I love about this conference is that it's actually talking about workers. Most of the conferences I go to either want to talk about the decline of the American empire, rather than the decline of labor, or want to talk about workers as the revolutionary agency, and never talk about workers at all in the rest of the conference. So I, I think this is, uh, this is great. I mean, this is an incredible defeat that we've gone through. In spite of these great signs that keep us going and that signal potentials, what's happened over the last 30 years, I think the first defeat has been a remarkable lowering of expectations. Workers had made gains through the 50s and 60s, and they were ready. They didn't have much of an alternative to give them up just to hang on to what they had. So we're talking about a working class that had made gains, and it was this lowering of expectations. Part of that lowering of expectations was that workers began to survive as individuals. They depended on working longer hours, their spouse working longer hours. They depended on young kids staying at home longer, even married couples moving in with their parents until they could pay for the mortgage. Uh, obviously, depending on homes as an asset, hoping that the stock market goes up because that will be your pension. And that had profound implications. When you're trying to survive individually as opposed to being in the street, uh, or, or as opposed to being on the picket line, you do see collective capacities after you. You begin to lose your collective sensibility. You begin to reproduce neoliberalism. And I think that's part of what was happening with the working class. Uh, the other thing that, that happened over the last 30 years is the left used to criticize unions for not being revolutionary organizations, for being reformist organizations. What happened over the 30 years is that unions lost even their ability to defend working people. And you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of reasons for that, but I think there's something really fundamental, and this could be controversial, that I want to throw out. I think there was always a problem with unions and that they were always sectional organizations in terms of how they were organized. Uh, you know, in the early organizing, you always went beyond that to get the union going, but as the union got institutionalized, it became about representing your particular members. And that worked for a while. It worked in the 50s and 60s. Other people could emulate it, and you could spread to other parts of society that weren't unionized. Uh, that ended. That's over. And we have to come to grips with the fact that's over. And the only way uh, unions can survive and progress in any way is if they actually have a class sense of it. Steve is absolutely right about that. Now, I'm not saying that unions become revolutionary organizations. I think unions, just by their very nature, they bargain with an employer. They bargain, you know, when you bargain, you're hoping that you're going to make a compromise and it's going to be over. This isn't all out war forever. Uh, but you have to have some kind of a class sensibility that affects your strategy and that understands what you're fighting for and it speaks to how you relate to others in terms of developing things. Uh, now, I'm very skeptical about unions being able to overcome this through some internal dynamic. I mean, the thing about the 30s was that there were communist parties. It didn't just happen that uh, uh, workers spontaneously emerged. There were communist parties, there were socialists. That was a key part of the story, not the whole story. Uh, and there weren't unions, which gave you an obvious thing to build. Right now, a lot of this still will get sucked into unions. Uh, the, I'd like to speak to some of the things that I think you do different when you start thinking of unions as potentially class, as, as being able to bring a class sensibility into their strategic discussions. And I wanted to say some things about organizing and where the left, what role the left plays. But I'm going to say that tonight after dinner. Uh, what, if, if workers in the private sector are going to are going to fight back, they have to be able to do something about jobs. What kills them is the threat, and it's real, that uh, they're, they're having to compete, and if they don't behave, if they're not disciplined, they're going to lose their job. You can't just go in and say, well, ignore it. It's not going to happen. They see it around them. We have a plan from Chrysler that for 12 years worked overtime. 
12 years steady over time. When we did a survey of whether they were nervous or not, they were as nervous as anybody else because they saw plants closing around them. They saw what was happening to their neighbors. They thought about what would happen if they lost some of them. So the question of jobs is something that we have to deal with. And I don't think we can anymore think we can deal with the jobs question just by <coughs> calling for Keynesian stimulus. Employers aren't interested in that kind of alliance they were interested in a long time ago. Or just thinking in terms of strengthening our corporations that inevitably leads to just a corporatism that kills us. Auto workers end up calling for subsidies to General Motors, and as soon as they're done with the subsidies, the next question obviously is the state gave this, the taxpayer gave this, what are you giving up now? Uh, and it just leads to concessions. There has to be a notion that if we're going to address the question of jobs, we have to address the question of corporate power. And it's, it's difficult. We don't have the kind of capacity to win that yet. But when the auto crisis hit, instead of saying, how do we save a piece of the auto industry, what we could have done is to try to change the discourse in ways that I think Steve was hinting at. We could have said, the issue here is we actually have productive capacity that can support the community in all kinds of ways. The issue shouldn't here, here shouldn't be profit, but use. It shouldn't be competition, but democratic planning. We could have said we can take all this productive capacity and convert it through some kind of a democratic plan to meet all the things we're going to need for the next century in terms of the environment, as well as other things. That just would have been a different discourse. They would have positioned workers differently. They would have positioned them differently in terms of talking to their neighbors. Talking about saving General Motors and giving them subsidies at a time when everybody was facing cuts was guaranteed to isolate you and make sure you were too weak to win. Public sector, and I, again, here I really want to reinforce what uh, Steve was getting at. The public sector can't win unless they see themselves as the leaders in the fight for public services. They see themselves as leading in a class fight. Now, the critical point about that is you go to any convention in the public sector and they'll all agree. They'll have a banner that says we love social services, they'll put up a, you know, a, a billboard in a parking lot. But that's not the question. People are cynical about that. They do see that as opportunity. So yeah, we have to prove that we really represent the community in the way that Chicago teachers did. And proving it actually means changing everything about our union. Because if you're serious about showing that you represent public services, you have to change how you're completely structured. You have to change your relationship to your members being organizers. You have to change what the staff does. You have to change what you put resources in. But you have to change bargaining. And that's a whole big question, whether unions are actually ready. I think in this period of time, it makes a lot of sense, since we're not making wage gains, to say we're going to put bargaining, we're going to put social services on the agenda. One of the common things anywhere I've been that affects people has been workloads. Everybody is being incredibly squeezed, and this is what you don't talk about because you're giving up something in the workplace so you can maintain some income for your family. But people are really being hammered, and it doesn't matter whether it's nurses, you know, garbage collectors, teachers, everybody. But workload is immediately linked to services. It's a link to something in public. You could make a fight over workload. It's not just about just being altruistic, but it is recognizing that if you're going to fight to defend anything, if you want to defight your pension, as a teacher, the worst thing to stand up and say is I want to defend my pension when nobody else has one. The best thing to do would be to talk about the quality of education, what's happening to black kids in the school system, who really represents them. If you win that fight, you'll have support for the fight along, around pensions. Uh, organize. You can be really cute and smart and you can probably organize some places just by thinking of it as a technical problem and putting some resources in. But that hasn't made the breakthroughs in the key sectors and it won't make the breakthroughs. It has to be about, we need to build the working class. Otherwise, we're completely isolated as human beings. If we can't build the working class, we're finished. And what that means is, you know, you go in like fast food. Why can't we organize fast food? You're not going to move to Germany. Uh, you know, in any working class towns, these are sons and daughters of people. Uh, we can't organize them because unions compete with each other. Or they're thinking that these are low wages. So what do you want to organize them for anyways? But we could actually declare, we're going to start servicing people in the fast food sector. It could be over human rights human right stuff, shit stuff, not getting paid, um, and eventually getting a dollar or two, if you can, in dues, but finding out where we're strong. But even if you don't organize the fast food, these are people who are going to move someplace else who remember the union. Uh, strategically, we keep thinking about how we're weak because everything can go to China. What's happening in the US, first of all, is restructuring. That's more important generally than what's going to China. It changes within the United States. American auto industry is actually getting a lot of new investment. But there's all kinds of new strategic centers that we have to think about. 
Maybe it was Ottawa in the 30s, maybe today's warehouses. Maybe it's the transportation hubs that can shut down everything. Maybe with all this outsourcing from the assemblers, it's suppliers who can now shut down all kinds of plants uh, that we have to, to think about. And one of the things I, I think we need to think about is time. People are so squeezed on time and not having flexibility on time or running between two jobs that I don't know when they have time to read or to think and to participate and to go to meetings. I said this at a meeting in, uh, in England and uh, the guy from Spain really attacked me. He said the problem is that uh, you're not giving people uh, the kind of things to do that they would prefer to do than sitting at home watching television. And I think there's something to that. I mean, you can really mobilize people when there's something really going on that's crucial. But I, I do think the question of uh, time is important. And the other thing we have to think about is that if we're going to adopt these strategies, if our argument in the public sector, for example, is that uh, the key in the public sector is to actually say we're fighting for everybody, then you have to think about, well, what do strikes do? How do you say you represent everybody? and then strike and take away the service. So that just demands thinking much more creatively about how we conduct strikes. We had a, we had a strike in, uh, in Toronto. Uh, the garbage guys were put out first by the union, a sacrificial lines actually, they were least popular. The library workers were incredibly popular. Uh, but, you know, instead of coordinating it with selective strikes, rotating strikes or something, they put out the garbage guys. But even the garbage guys, Instead of having them drop the garbage off in a public park, which made everybody angry, they could have dropped the garbage off, as one worker suggested, on Bay Street, Wall Street, the financial district, put it in their parking lots, make the connection concretely between austerity and finance. Uh, we had a strike of postal workers, and the postal workers kept delivering the mail to retirees. The government uh, made that illegal and told the retirees to come to a warehouse to pick it up and were hoping that the posties would come down and pick it. Instead, the posties came down with lawn chairs and coffee and said, uh, we'd actually like to bring you this at home so you don't have to sit here in the hot sun and do it, but they won't let us do it. Uh, we had, uh, uh, at the Public Service Alliance, the people who run the unemployment insurance were told they had to have a quote on how many people they cut off. And if you didn't cut them off, you'd be fired. What the union did is it actually prepared a document that said this is how you should answer every question legally so there are no grounds for firing you. And we had other unions deliver it to protect those workers. Uh, we're coming up for a strike in the long-term health care sector. The leader of the union came up with a, a suggestion of why don't we have a working group. Nobody wants to strike against people, the workers themselves. It's illegal, but illegal, illegality doesn't bother them. It's that they don't want to strike against people who with disabilities and old people. So he suggested that we actually bring in people from other shifts and the people who are there to work for free and show the kind of services you can provide if you really care about the service. And what are they going to do? Kick you out? And do this one community at a time where you get a lot of publicity? But he got a reaction from the members for all kinds of reasons. Some people, it's just the culture of the union is we don't work for free. But you have to cope with. Some cases it was, well, this means developing all kinds of organizers who are going to be challengers. And in some cases, it was leaders who actually felt that, let's just go out on strike, you move back to work, nobody will blame us, and we'll be over. It's safer. So there were those problems. Um, so uh, uh, let me just wrap up with a couple of things. Uh, one is, uh, this question of workers, are whether they're passive or not, is a crucial question. How do we understand the working class? And I, I don't see any workers who don't think that the system sucks. We used to always think that this is the crit critical thing we had to go convince people of. The system sucks. <laughs> people know that the system sucks. The problem is that there's a sense of fatalism. You can't do anything about it. But it, it is the Tina thing. And, and the point about people's expectations being low is that expectations depend on what people think is possible. And what they think is possible depends on organization. It depends on whether there are structures to which they can work, struggle, and have confidence that will matter. If, they don't, if those don't exist, people will be fatalistic. This is the way the world works. I'll just adapt to it somehow. So we have to have this discussion about uh, 
what kind of structures are needed so that people can develop that kind of confidence that change is possible? How do they relate to the working class so it isn't just a question of handing out uh, papers that people throw away at the gate? But we also have to ask some really harder questions. We can't just say we want the welfare state, for example. Uh, the welfare state is gone, and it doesn't just come back without changing power in so many more ways today. We, we're going to have to start also learning how we talk about questions of democratizing the banks if we treat them as, as a utility when they're in trouble. Why aren't they a democratic utility? We're going to have to talk about putting controls on capital. And those are much bigger questions that are also more difficult to deal with just in, uh, in, in a union context. Um, so just. This question of utopia, maybe I'll just end with that, because we we're supposed to talk about it. Uh, Mar Marx, Marx tried to politicize utopia by saying, you can't just talk about this dream, otherwise it's just you know, some dream and uh, it doesn't mean anything. It's a daydream, it's a diversion. You, ha you have to have an agent. And he identified the working class as an agent. But it was always problematic. It was never you know, something inherent about being a worker that necessarily made you into a revolutionary. And 20 years before he wrote the manifesto, Saint Simon was looking at workers working in industry, and he said, Who would even think that anybody who is this oppressed and this brutalized and is just sitting there in this localized space would even think of socialism? Would even think of an idea of socialism being possible? And the link between capitalism creates people to fit capitalism. I mean, one of the things we have to ask is, why do we think that people whose everyday experience in life is that your skills are narrow, that uh, you know, you're made completely dependent on an employer who has all the connections and knows everything, you're fragmented from the rest of the working class, how can a group like that possibly change society? And the link is that what's bad about capitalism is that it's a society in which our capacities to do, to create, to plan, to execute are controlled by somebody else. That's the fundamental problem. And in exchange for it, we get to do some consumption. And the key to overcoming it is to think in terms of capacities. Everything we do has to be about how do we build the kind of capacities that can begin to overcome that. Because even if somebody gave us the world tomorrow, they said, here, it's yours, you can have it. I don't think we'd know what to do with it. People might disagree, but I just think that we wouldn't know what to do with it. It's something you learn, and you only learn it primarily through struggle. You learn all kinds of things on the picket line about yourself, about others, about capacities you didn't think you have. And so I think this question of capacities is the link between the vision of society, where all our capacities are developed, the critique of capitalism, in terms of what it does to our capacities, and what we have to build if we want to bridge it. emancipatory radical left politics today. It is obvious that the fight for improving the conditions of the working people stands on its own feet, and it is relatively independent from the fight to overcome the dominant way of organizing the production. However, I think that the new conditions regarding the status of labor today questions pressingly this independence. Clearly, I'm not an expert on labor issues. I'm not even an activist in traditional labor movement. So I approach the issue in a much more open and free way. I let my imagination take over and determine my talk based, of course, on my political, my own political experience. And nothing of what I will say reflect in any, reflect in any sense the position of my party in this issue. Um, okay, so neoliberalism destroys systematically the economies, shaping a totally different situation. Today, unemployment is permanent in some regions of developed countries. The capitalist crisis in the developed world renders the working population obsolete. Today, we, 
workers of any kind are more than the capital can utilize due to its crisis. And of course, technological advantages once again threaten massively the working class. In this context, in this, in this context, and especially in Greece and in some of the Europe, there is no place for partial victory in a, in a specific working section. Neoliberalism sweeps every resistance away. The working people are facing a total attack in every domain. The working conditions are depressing. The morale is miserable, and the threat of unemployment lingers everywhere. The only regional demand at the moment is a total radical political overthrow of the government, of the austerity policies, and so on. So our predicament is this, that it is more probable to achieve a huge political change and open a path for the overcoming of capitalism, so to speak, rather than to achieve a moderate increase of salaries. The developed societies, like the Greek one and the other societies in Southern Europe, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, the developed societies like the Greek one and the other societies in Southern Europe will face sooner or later an existential deadlock. We cannot go back to the previous dominant paradigm. The previous status of labor will change, it's changing. The traditional way of fighting for better working conditions, increase of wages and so on that saved the traditional labor movement is vanishing. Nothing of what we know seems to work. With neoliberalism, with neoliberalism, we are falling into an abyss of undignified life. And the question is, is there, where, is there a way out? Is there a compass to give us direction? Is the labor movement of a, a new kind in position to contribute to this urgent demand? Okay, so additionally to these issues, societies with huge unemployment, which will be our predicament in the developed world, the question of how the economy will develop in order to absorb quickly the superfluous labor is of extreme political importance for the balance of power that will determine the outcome, uh, the future. Here the labor movement must, but also the working people in general, face novel queries that coincide with the political struggle and collision and fight between neoliberals and radical left. The neoliberal strategy is crystal clear. The only way is undignified income and working conditions, no restrictions, working, environmental, archaeological, etc., for attracting uh, investments, destruction, destruction of the countries and, and the future of the population, etc. Is there another way? The question is this. Is it possible to give a model of development that will impose both conditions in capitalist development in favor of the society and the people and at the same time will promote a rival way of production, fighting unemployment and reversing the disastrous course we are facing, in a way that transcends the almost divine motto, private investments create jobs. Is there another way to proceed without bowing to the logic of profit and competition that leads straight away to the working conditions of China? This is a crucial point since the remaining official labor movement and the masses of the unemployed and desperate people may be prone to follow neoliberals at this point. The private, the private investments create jobs becomes like a second nature to the people. People do not even consider the possibility of something different and the left must be very determined and inventive to break this spell. So the conclusion in this part of my talk is that today in countries of all regions in which the neoliberal revolution demolishes the mid-class pseudo cosmos of the end of history fairy tale, and also demolishes the traditional trade unionist systemic economic struggle, we need a different model of production that transcends the logic of profit and competition. For example, social economy, clusters of small self-managed co cooperatives together with public institutions of democratic planning and public companies in strategic sections of the, of the economy under social and labor control may be part of such a model that, we, that it will eventually save a labor movement that not only demands from the employers, but also takes responsibility for the cost of society because it controls part of the production. Um, okay, so what would be a new restructuring of the labor movement that would save the subjective conditions for its contribution to this emancipatory, emancipatory process? 
course, the, new, the, the, the labor movement needs a drastic, drastic change of paradigm. The key idea I would like to suggest to you today is that the superfluous scientific manpower of the developed world may be the best candidate to take the role of the Magat or, or a leading role of the labor movement in a direction of radicalizing the horizon of its fights towards emancipatory politics. I know very well that traditionally the most educated part of the working class occupy administrative or managerial positions in the production, in the production and they perceive their interests as aligned with those of the employers and companies. However, in our situation today, the, the scientific manpower is characterized by some distinctive features that can be extremely valuable in class struggle. Due to the fights of the people within the last century and the expansion of capitalism after the Great War, and despite the systematic and determined efforts of neoliberals during the last decades, in European developed countries, maybe in another and other developed countries. An annoying phenomenon, phenomenon, annoying for them, phenomenon took, took place. Members of the working class and the lower classes had access to education. Massive entrance in the universities may have been part of the plan for some time. However, the social inertia and the favorable balance of forces sustained it for long, contributing to the expansion of new class and the better education of the working. Today, neoliberals cannot tolerate this disturbance anymore. This disturbance will not last for long, for long enough for the next uh, generation. This is their strategy. And the stra their strategy for the existing superfluous scientific manpower is just to marginalize it. Even before the outburst of the revolution, the neoliberal revolution we are facing in, in Europe, European strategy for education within the last decades focused on the downgrading of the majority of the universities, keeping a few for the elites, through the modification of scientific education, which was based on standards, high standards, according to the respective disciplines, to a vocational training focused on, 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 on nurturing abilities in operating the relevant software following ISO regulations and stuff like that. And this strategy aimed at transforming scientific manpower, which has the ability to rethink, control, and influence the process of production, into operators that lack all these abilities. The technological advance of various kinds of specialized software rendered possible the detachment, <coughs> the, know, the detachment of the scientific means of production, so to speak, from the scientific manpower and their embodiment in the so in software. The situation is interestingly similar to the downgrading, downgrading of the skilled craftsmen in the 19th century due to the advance of the technology and of the organizational progress. It is crucial for our discussion to note that, most powerful, that the most powerful trade unions back then were those that were founded on former unions of skilled craftsmen and they appeared in industrial sections where the machines didn't replace skilled manpower, but there were a combination between manual labor and steam power. Trade unionism in more modernized industries of the time where the detachment was complete was insignificant. I'm not an expert, but maybe the traditional idea, idea that the vanguard of the working class is the industrial proletariat stems from the type of the skilled craftsman who knows, who is at the center of the new productive process with a respectful role, who necessarily confronts the intentions of the owners because they, these are the intentions are against his own, his own identity, and who has the right or who feels that he has the right and the expertise to lead a new self-managed organization, production, and so on. All these features, all these features, I think, are valid in the case in the case of the scientific man manpower today. The existing scientific manpower is the lost generation the media talks of. However, history will judge whether they are lost or not. There is a window of, of opportunity for them and with them, with them for all. They possess scientific means of production, 
that allow, that allow them to be autonomous, active and creative in production. They have unfulfilled expectations because of mass unemployment, and they invested effort and time in vain. They have abilities and capacities which are becoming useless, and they have no future if things follow the neoliberal path. Several theoreticians posit again a well like a well-known criteria <coughs> regarding which part of the people uh, regarding the part of the people which may play a crucial role in the struggle against the existing order of things. The criterion is that the part of the people who has no proper part in the existing order, um, the part which is not part, a proper part of the whole, has the potential to overthrow the existing order that does not include it. They suggest that the excluded, those who do not belong to the existing social body, like the ones who live in slums, those are the part of no part, that they may have the potential to lead the fight against the existing order. What if, however, the order of things that we must change is not the previous one, the one of the post-war social contract? What if, excuse me, the post-war social contract, contract is already being demolished by the neoliberals? So the new order of things, the brave new world of the neoliberals, which, must be, which we must overthrow, includes and promotes the status of a human being with no rights, no face, like the excluded of the previous things. People with no rights, like those, like those in the slums or the illegal immigrants, is not an exception. It is a standard condition for the majority of the people according to the neoliberal fantasy and idea. If this is the new order of thing, things, then the part of no part, the part that has no position in the new world, is exactly the type of people who, although are no part of the elite, are nevertheless educated and capable of autonomous activity and hard to be disciplined. By the way, they are the social support of democracy in society. Those people, those people are the part of no part. These people are the ones who do not fit within the neoliberal order of things. They are facing extinction, extinction, and for this reason, they have nothing to lose. If this is, is on, on, a right, on the right track, how is it possible to actualize this paradigm, paradigm change in the labor movement and in radical left? A change that utilizes at the maximum the objective conditions offered today through the scientific manpower for a new alliance capable of to, to revitalize a radical, radical labor movement and give less to a radical left plan. How is it possible, for example, today in Greece and elsewhere to change the perspective of thousands of young scientists who are in depression because of unemployment and idleness, who wake up every morning having nothing to expect. How can we change the dominant question each time then? From the question, when will a, man, a money owner invest to gain profit so that I will find a job, to a question, why am I not in charge of production? Why am I not ruling the country today? And why am I not ruling the whole world tomorrow? Instead of the dominant, dominant feeling of, an, uh, of useless, uselessness, uselessness and pathetic dependency from the mind name money owner, the scientific manpower must develop the feeling of the usurpation of its right to rule the world by the money owners. How is this possible? One step the left could take in this process would be to face its, its own imaginary self-image that prevents, according to my opinion, a paradigm change. From the industrial working to the scientist as the imaginary core of the left and labor idea. This is difficult because it would cause huge changes in various levels, and people are suspicious of changes <coughs> in, the, in the left after the fall of the Soviet Union. The retreat of the left globally the last 20 years and the acceptance of capitalism as the unquestioned reality from the majority of the left and of the left and labor organizations, posited to all of us who wanted to keep the vision of another society alive, a crucial duty to remain faithful to the previous forms, since most of the changes proposed ended up in acts of surrender. It is time to admit that we no longer need to be just faithful but effective as well. 
It is not an act of treason to break with the traditional forms in order to remain faithful to the content, in order to be effective. Our history, our deep respect to our ancestors, and the adoption of their vision should not be an obstacle in performing our own historical role. A role which could be assessed not by, I, not by our, faith in, our faith in the forms of the past, but by our effectiveness today. Radical left and labor movements should be open and ready to change in order to merge, to merge into something which is able to make emancipatory politics a historical agent in the new conditions of mass, un mass unemployment, mass unemployment, and capable to threaten global capitalism and nothing less. Otherwise, emancipatory politics will just will remain just another parcel identity <coughs> among others. Thank you. one question to the panelists, um, and then we'll open it up to uh, Q&A from the floor very briefly, and I apologize. Uh, we have run a little bit over. It looks like we're going to run a little bit over, so if anyone has to leave for another panel, you know, take your prerogative. Um, the three presentations all touched um, different notes regarding the issue of class, appealing past the sectional interests of workers in unions as an organization. Um, this question is pitched to Steve and Sam and then Andreas, if you, know, if you would like to comment from your perspective as well, organizing um, from public sector workers, because this is going to deal a little bit with the teachers union um, and the Wisconsin uh, uh, mobilizing. In terms of building the capacity to strike, in terms of building the capacity for some kind of activist culture in the unions, in the class, in the community, um, Stephen, first, um, if you could elaborate more on the role of a political understanding, a political critique, a social critique, looking at some of the points raised by Andreas and Sam with regard to unemployment. What does a broader critique look like? Um, does it have a role in creating the capacity among union membership to become more militant, to become more active? In particular, I'm thinking about um, the role of CORE, uh, the Caucus of Rank and File uh, Educators, in leading the Chicago Teachers Union during the first strike or during this 2012 strike. What kind of capacity is built when you start questioning the legitimacy of, you know, let's say how, you know, how taxes are raised in the city of Chicago? You know, who has the money? When you start questioning property relations generally, uh, what, what kind of capacity does that build as opposed to people who are more, or who are less willing to take a direct critique uh, forward to union members who are more uh, willing to basically use the same union pragmatism that is you know, traditionally responsible for sort of the apathy on the union left um, or in the labor movement as a whole, uh, excuse me. And then Sam, um, if you could elaborate a little bit on the role of Political organizations and articulating what you know some of the broad strokes you've laid out around planning, around unemployment. What what is the interaction? You know, moving past unions as sectionalism. If you could talk a little bit more about your projects, you know, what sort of that political critique looks like. What how does that need to be sketched out for people? What is the role in uh, of politics in building? the capacity to move beyond unions as sectional uh, representatives. You know, what, what does it look like when we start talking about class and, and how is the mobilization around issues that affect the class as a whole happen? 
Um, and Andreas, if you could comment a little bit on the connection um, between the political and, you know, you, you laid out in your talk about being open to new, um, you know, opportunities raised by the development of production, looking at people involved in intellectual labor. What kind of political development do you think needs to occur? And what does that look like? What, how do we move past people wanting to partner with management, which is the easiest way to create jobs right now. If you're going to be pragmatic about it, management holds all the cards when it comes to the economic development. I mean, we've seen projects here in America where uh, you know, a union like the UAW wants to you know, have co-management with the auto company. Germany, the union sit on the board. Um, how do you avoid um, sort of merging into sort of a corporatist ideology on the level of you know pragmatically moving forward on bringing certain members of the union bureaucracy into planning production? Um, because that seems to be the most you know expedient way of going about it. Um, so I guess if you wouldn't mind starting off again, Steve. So, that was a lot. Um, I would say two things, for example, about the teachers. One, it was all about creating a culture of organizing. It was about hiring organizing staff that hadn't existed before. It was about transforming a union from the top down to a bottom up union. And, and a strategy and a structure of how to organize the members. But it was also, from the beginning, very much about analysis and about study. The, Caucus of Rank and File Educators began as a study group. Their first book was uh, Naomi Klein's book. What's the name of the book? Shock Doctrine. Shock Doctrine. Shock Doctrine. Shock Doctrine. So, and every time I go to the CTU, somebody says, have you read this book? We're reading this book. Um, so I don't want to leave an impression that they're not intellectual, that they're only focused on organizing. They're very focused on analyzing what is going on with American capitalism. And how have we built movements in the past? And how do we understand what's going on? And they have a research department that's always putting out studies. They, they're very focused on analyzing what's happening with race in this country. Here's a study called The Black and White of Education in Chicago's Public Schools. It's a great, great study analyzing very concretely what's happened um, and why this is a racist attack on public education in Chicago. Um, and you know, in the 1930s, many of the people who led the organizing were radicals and socialists and communists. Um, and there are certainly many people of a radical background uh, in the Chicago Teachers Union that have brought that analysis. You know, this, they didn't get elected with no history at all. Um, they came as activists who've been involved in fighting class struggle battles for many years. And they brought that analysis together. And there was no sectarianism among them. They, were, they don't care about your background. We're not going to fight each other. We're going to agree to disagree when we disagree. <clears throat> so it's been both. It's been an organizing culture and an intellectual analysis of capitalism and race in America. And how do we respond and resist? Um, just in, in the airlines, one of the things we tried to do was to build uh, uh, links across unions, the three different unions in the airlines. And it was one way of both being more effective and getting around the problem of bureaucracy in the unions, but it was also to give the workers themselves some sense of not just focusing on their own union, which tends to become very parochial, or just trying to change the leadership, which in itself has its limits. But to actually begin to realize that there was a class and there were class battles. And then in the airline industry, there was immediately, as soon as we started to do that, a wildcat, which was very successful. But part of our role was actually to talk about wildcats themselves not being enough. The company had the power to outsource work. What were the strategies for doing that? So we did, we did educationals uh, at the airports. Um, in the garbage strike, the main concern of workers was job security. 
So the union did it by seniority and by buyouts, which basically meant younger workers were going to be laid off. And you, again, you raise this question of what kind of a class perspective is, uh, is this that uh, the answer is let somebody else be laid off. Uh, so we try to get private, uh, fight privatization in the sector and show that you could actually improve services. Uh, but we had a major problem of how to actually get into the union. There was no strike on, so there weren't pick lines to go to and to hand us out. So we did a video which we distributed electronically. Uh, and it happened that it happened that a competing union actually loved the video and gave it a lot of distribution. But uh, uh, you know, so so we tried to do it by getting the information out that way. And we did pamphlets on trying to put the struggle of the public sector uh, in a class context. We spent, we spent some good time trying to do education, but we did have a problem of how do you get in? How do you make inroads at a moment in time when there aren't a lot of strikes going on and you don't have a lot of people who are activists in their organization? And by the way, yeah. yeah so. uh, imagine a situation. Um, you are having massive unemployment and a vast number of un unsatisfied social needs. Okay, let's, let's imagine a scenario like this. Of course, capitalism has its own answer. Okay, build an exactly. Be competitive, and you will find a way to to survive. We we need another model of answering this, the, the same question, how we should, how we could uh, <coughs> satisfy social needs in a way that, in a, in a different way than the proposed way. And we, we haven't worked on that. And I am saying that the, it's, it's more possible to, to find a, an alternative way to this capitalist way of answering the questions, rather than to be able to satisfy the working class needs inside the capitalist mode of production. That's that's what I was trying to say. Because of the current situation, this is how things are evolving. We are no longer needed by the way uh, the, the production is organized. So either we will be marginalized or we will find a way to do it with our own way. That's what I was trying to say. Now, problems regarding how we should organize the decision-making processes, the model of production, different um, uh, ways to, to, to coordinate social needs with uh, productive <coughs> units. They, all, all these are uh, questions that we should answer. But the first thing that we should do is to, um, to realize to some extent that, there, that this is what we should try to answer. Because, because there is a, a tendency, a, an inertia to, to, have, to, to, our, to our strategy to give fights inside the, 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 the existing mode of organizing the production in order to secure rights, but as everybody said, this is not going to work, and it's not working at the moment, and it's not going to work in the future, so we cannot just be uh, inactive and wait just to see what is going to happen. We can, uh, we can begin from now to, 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 to explore different ways of organizing production. Some said pre uh, previously that if <coughs> the, the capitalism, uh, abol um, even if somebody give us, right, has, given, uh, has given us the opportunity to organize uh, the society as we would like to organize it, we don't know how to do it. Hmm? That was what some said. We don't have the capacities. I believe strongly that we have the capacities. We don't have the mindset. It. We don't believe it. We don't have the subjective uh, 
position of really uh, take the responsibility of doing it. That's that's what that's what I was trying to say. And all these problems that you have mentioned are problems to be faced. But first of all, we have to decide that we should move forward to this direction in order to face this problem management. Uh, we'll give uh, Danny the first uh, question, and then Ed for his service help out with the idea, and then we'll take. Uh, we'll take all three, and then we'll let the panel. This question is mainly presented to the Sun Race that's already entered it in this speech. Let's uh, talk about class sensibility that has sort of come up within the unions. And uh, once we begin talking about this, there becomes a relationship between unions and the unemployed. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, what do you think, or how do how you create an effective relationship between unions and the unemployed, especially since a lot of unions immediate interest can be in direct contradiction to the unemployed. If they're seeking to maintain their jobs for wages, it can, you know, prevent people getting jobs. You know, even even Keynes has kind of a thing that wages alone can't spur any jobs that it can really only sort of maintain. Certain levels, um, and I guess Andreas, you can answer that too. But I thought you already sort of answered that. Um, Ed? Yeah, my question is related but distinct. Should unions and workers pursue a politics of full employment? If so, how? At what scale? And if not, why not? Yeah, and just so I was just thinking about this panel where you have three people, you know, Stephen who you know, stresses the need to be active and talks about sort of the problem when you have sectarian groups trying to sell their own line, sell their own paper. To contrapose that, but Kinden, who thinks that, you know, obviously labor unions are not revolutionary as such, and there might be this need for you know, other organizations, although they've failed, and they're kind of pushed, there's sort of this absence there. And then you have this, like, person who's at the center of a large capitalist organization trying to reorganize the needs of production in Greece. So there's, like, a lot of disagreement here. And obviously there's agreement, too, like, there's a, a sense of the fatalism that I think Gaiden and, and Ashby both touched on. There's like a hopelessness. Uh, but I, I wanted you guys to reflect on what you disagree about in terms of your approaches, because I think that would be really instructive. You know, in Greece, in the context of there's a massive labor you know, movement, uh, but there's also the recognition that it's dying as well, and that there's just an absence of jobs. And so I think that's another question about there's this problem with low employment. And I wanted to talk about the possibility of utopian thinking and utopian programs. I mean, in Chicago, when you had, it was in Chicago that there was a movement for the eight hour day, which was utopian programmatic and, and far bigger than any labor union, than any one labor union. It was citywide, and it was, it was a, a kind of demand that you don't, you don't see anymore. And so if we, could, if we could address that. Well, Gabe, I think one way to put a point on the utopian aspect of the question is to look at immigration, because that's also been a hot topic for the labor movement. And when you look at immigration, um, one thing that gets flagged as utopian is the fact of you know, giving citizenship to anyone who wants to come to the United States. The AFL-CIO has recently endorsed a path to citizenship um, for a lot of people. And I think this ties into the concerns with unemployment and how we achieve full employment. Because once you start talking about open citizenship, you're really talking about full employment for the entire continent. Um, and I think that is something that could definitely be considered utopian, especially for the American labor movement, which has traditionally been um, very uh, nationalist focused. Um, you know, it looks at the American labor market when it's the American labor movement. Canada hasn't necessarily had the same pressures of uh, America in terms of its immigration system, but when you're talking about what do we do with the unemployed, what do we do with people who come in for skills who are immigrants who have you know, no uh, income base when they come here, and then we give uh, legal citizenship. But what does that look like? Um, is that something that we need to put on the agenda as utopian, as something that we may not achieve now and we take a principal stand on it? Um, Steve, if you wouldn't mind getting your opinion first, and then maybe Sam. Unless Sam wants to, look. unless Sam would like to go first and get to Steve. Uh, no, you want to. Okay, I'll, I'll go. I think I'm going first. Uh, okay, the unemployed question, first of all. Uh, 
there's a lot of unions who are now starting to talk about uh, having individual members. Uh, you don't have to have an actual work site, uh, but you can join the union. Uh, and it begs up a million questions about how that would work. Because if you don't have a clear idea of how it would work, you'll just end up giving them a cheaper credit card. I think you've done something. You won't be mobilizing or organizing anything. But, but I think this question of the unemployment is crucial. I think if workers can't organize, their own members who have just been laid off, what confidence do you have in them organizing anybody? These are people that they've just been in touch with. And you know, they've got all kinds of things they can do. They've got union halls, they can bring them in in terms of uh, cultural spaces, they can mobilize them to fight for jobs in the community. Uh, one of the reasons that they don't do it is because they think it will be a pain in the ass. That these people will be expecting things, jobs, which the unions can't deliver on. And it's true. The point, however, is that you know, you, you mobilize them and you try to fight for them. And if you don't, these are exactly the kind of people who will become real union haters. The union loved me when I was paying dues, and as soon as I stopped paying dues, uh, they, you know, they weren't interested. So I, I think that's a really important issue. The question of uh, utopian ideas, uh, you know, and you maybe just link it to your question about full employment and jobs. So, you know, one idea we floated at, at some point is everybody has to go to school. Uh, why, why isn't everybody either have a job or be in training? Why couldn't we set up elected councils at the local level that do a survey of everything that's needed in the community, because there's always things that are needed, and everybody who has skills that aren't being used and you provide the child care that's necessary so that you could begin to match it. And I think that's a great idea, but it immediately takes you places. You have to say where the funds gonna come from. And then you figure out, well, you can't get the funds unless you have some control over the financial system. And if you have control over the financial system, you're not just challenging the banks because then you have to say, but we want to use the funds in a particular way. So you're actually talking about control over investment. And so you're talking about transforming society. So, so, so I, I, I guess to me, one of the questions I think we should always be asking isn't just the utopian ideas, which I have nothing against, <coughs> but <clears throat> how do we shift power so that we can actually do these things? Because if we can't, we have these great ideas that we're then going to find out we can't implement and we end up discrediting ourselves. So I think, we, I think in our strategies we should be thinking about what does it have to do with power. I mean, the teachers thing, one of the exciting things about it is that capacities were built for it. You know, if you actually, you know, if, if we're always thinking, uh, what does winning mean? And winning sometimes means you don't win your, the thing you're after. Winning means developing capacities. Uh, Developing collective capacities, and that's the big question. Right? You know, we, we just don't have any power. How do we change that? Um, you know, I'm not really optimistic about organizational real employment. I have to be frank. It was significant in the 30s, but we have unemployment insurance now, and we have food stamps now, and we have things that they were fighting for then. I, frankly, what I'm more excited about in terms of alternative forms of organization are things like the worker centers across the country. We have 200 worker centers that work with immigrant workers, many of them undocumented workers, who suffer from uh, wage theft. In Cook County alone, we have $7 million a week stolen from workers. $7 million a week. Because they're not paid overtime, they're not paid at all, they're, they're forced to work off the clock, they're not paid minimum wage. It, it's billions of dollars across this country. And the worker centers bring community pressure on employers when the workers come to them. And they say to the workers, look, we're, we're not like an agency that will solve this for you. If you want to get involved and become an organizer and join our organization, we'll fight this. Uh, my wife is the director of Arise Chicago, one of the worker centers in, in the town. They've begun to organize workers into unions. Not a union organ. They work with unions. But it, it's entire, they're really in charge of the campaign. This is entirely new. This is entirely different. We have the uh, Warehouse Workers for Justice near Joliet. It's not a traditional organizing campaign. Traditionally in America, a union goes in, they assign one or two staffers, they see if there's interest, they have an election, they leave it, they lose, and they're gone. This is about going in and staying, and forming an organization now, and acting like you have a union, and fighting now. It's a whole different form of organizing. And if something's gonna explode in America, it's gonna be organizing like this not the traditional union organizing. And it's the worker-led organization, it's totally bottom-up. The union puts the resources in, but they don't control it. 
It's all about solidarity and building a public campaign. It's very community-based. It's the same with uh, Fight for 15, the Fight uh, for $15 an hour for the downtown retail workers uh, and fast food workers. It isn't going to be industrial workers like the 30s, but it probably will be retail and service workers. We're the masses of uh, poverty level workers in this country. Right now in New York, there's the fast food strike. We've had them here in New York before. They're small, but this is the beginning. This is the tip of the iceberg of organizing. These workers that are just sick to death, they just had a, a meeting two nights ago in New York, and they had know, 100 plus workers there. And they said, what do you make? You know, and half of them said $7.25 an hour. There is no state minimum wage in New York. The other half were under $8 an hour. Our minimum wage in Illinois is $8.25. All those workers are making less than the minimum wage, which is horrible in Illinois. And New York is an extremely expensive city. People are angry, and they're beginning to organize. I, I have confidence in, in that sort of thing. The worker centers, our Walmart is another kind of ongoing, permanent effort to try to organize Walmart workers. At some point, if we're going to win, there'll be an explosion of Walmart workers. So actually, I put more hope in those forms of organization than I do the unemployed, who tend to be kind of animized. Um, I don't know how to except keep talking too much to answer all the other questions. So, I mean, we do need a more radical program. We need to demand full employment. We need to demand not just jobs, which the Republicans say they're for, but living wage jobs, real <coughs> living wage jobs. We need to go beyond what the Democratic Party is for and push them and denounce them and, uh, and make them do it. I mean, President Obama, when he was campaigning, said, uh, let's see if I got the quote, when I'm uh, president, I will walk in the picket lines with you. I don't know. You know, I will be there for you. Oops. And he's been gone for four years, and, and we don't call him enough on that. We don't pick at him enough. We, don't, you know. we need to push. The Democratic Party has declared war on public sector workers, along with the Republicans. <clears throat> it's a whole new environment out there now. We need to organize different ways. I, I'm not really that caught up in utopia. I don't use the word utopia. I'm a little caught off guard. I had several conversations with organizers. I'm like, what is this conference about? <laughs> and maybe because I'm not, you know, in my 20s anymore. But it could be it. Um, and I've lived in America. I hate to say that. Through 30 plus years of organizing. I believe, though, that we saw in the Wisconsin uprising, we saw in the teacher struggle, we saw it occupy a sense of people feeling a power, that things have changed, that we are different, that we kind of a microcosm of what the world could be. To me, that's the, the vision of utopia. When I go to the General Assembly of Occupy and I see the participatory democracy, now people love one another, uh, and how they handle disagreements, I feel like that is, that is the seed of a new world. Um, it looks like we actually have to... Uh, we have another panel happening in here now, yeah. in two minutes. So unfortunately, we may have to walk out